Good afternoon. I'll talk about the uh, integrated micro optical synthesizer. It's a teamwork between UC Davis, OE Wave, uh, East Santa Barbara, Freedom Photonics, Santa Stanford, and Daniel Virginia. And uh, the work that we present here does not reflect the opinions of DARPA, of our, our method of approaching this. And as John Bart made a, gave a very good uh, introduction, our motivation is that um, if you look at the RF frequency synthesizer, there's a lot of ubiquitous applications, especially the um, uh, cell phone applications and so on. And those are in the chip scale and low power. And there are a lot of uh, needs in the uh, optical frequency domain to do synthesizing the same way. But those tend to be very big. This is a Latin um, list. And uh, commercial frequency synthesizer from my uh, manual system, very expensive and large. So the, uh, the Lutwax picture is to kind of make it very inexpensive and um, low power, uh, less than one watt. And uh, basically the picture is to have the uh, optical frequencies to be synthesized through some RF reference, let's say 10 megahertz. It consists of uh, front end and back end. The front end, as mentioned earlier, will have frequency comb, and either you do 1F to 2F uh, stabilization or 2F, 3F stabilization. And once you have that uh, reference frequencies to be synthetic comb, the self stabilized to the uh, 10 megahertz reference, then what you can do is to come in with the tunable laser that can tune across those comb lines and uh, lock to the desired on offset frequencies. So that's basically a front end and back end. And uh, our approach is um, based on the front end, based on two resonators, two high Q resonators at uh, higher than 10 billion in Q. And then we have 26 gigahertz resonator, 10, uh, 104 gigahertz resonator. And I explain the details of front uh, end. And then back end consists of tuning the uh, tunable laser based on, in reference to those comb lines. And the gray line, gray boxes are the uh, electronics. So as mentioned earlier, uh, high Q resonator is enabler for um, stable and um, uh, narrow line with uh, resonator, the uh, frequency comes. There are basically two approaches to this. Um, the, uh, something that is easy to integrate on silicon or some platform tend to have Q in the millions, some hundreds of millions and so on, 10 millions and so on. Very nice work, but the, um, if we actually want to go further, go to Q of billions. There are micro machine ports and um, wet, wet edge silica, they, and then the uh, OE waves uh, Q, and this Q has 300 billion, Q of 300 billion with a B. And uh, we can measure this in the wind down. And, um, and as, as we can um, imagine, the high Q resonator is very important for the uh, uh, DOTOS project. But it tends to be having trouble. I mean, it's not as easy to integrate this on a chip scale. So I'm going to discuss that. Um, for the dispersion, um, um, for, for the resonator to be working in a soliton regime at 1550, we're using Mac fluoride resonator, and um, uh, those routinely can get a Q of 40 billion measured by the ring down uh, downtime at the uh, oil waves. And you can measure, uh, fabricate this in various sizes. The reason that the high Q is very important for DODAS, and we kind of emphasize that, is that the threshold for that nonlinear frequency comb generation tends to go at one over Q square. Noise tends to go down as Q square. And the comb bandwidth, when you try to generate the octave spanning comb, they tend to go like square root of Q. And then in commonly, they have limitation of the power. It goes like 1 over n square. And, um, but the high Q resonates. So therefore, high Q resonates are very important. There are two technical challenges I mentioned. Uh, regardless of what the resonator method you're going to use for chi 3 based uh, resonator, when you pump CW, you're going to generate the number of square root of comb. And in the time domain, the, the peak power is changed in the time domain. What that means is that the more combs you generate, the less power you get in total, total power coming out. And then, then uh, per comb line, the power is going to go down like 1 over n square. You could do a sink pump with the first pump. You still have limitation of tau over t, where the t is the first uh, uh, width. Uh, if you pump with CW, uh, as I mentioned, OE wave has been generating soliton like pulse routinely. But we still have this limitation, and that uh, number of comb lines is a challenge. Therefore, we decided to have two combs, uh, two resonators, as mentioned by uh, Santa Barbara. One will be at 24, uh, 26 gigahertz, another one 104 gigahertz. 
The second challenge is to achieve um, a high, cup, high uh, coupling coefficient um, coupling on a chip scale to the micro resonator that IQ of the hundreds of billions. And uh, we have looked into many different schemes, including grating coupler and so on. And uh, just recently, we have achieved the Q, uh, coupling of less than 2 dB uh, in function loss. It's based on uh, what um, Lutz uh, calls it as old new idea. They have been doing microprism based coupling all the time. And it's been nice to do this on a wave, waveguide scale. So we basically make a waveguide that looks like a prism. And they will couple in, couple out of that um, uh, uh, the pump wave and the frequency form. So this is a recent result where um, the chip that was fabricated at UC Davis couples light into the uh, resonator, and uh, we were achieving the total power loss of less than two dB, and we're able to generate frequency form. And um, initially, you see the line width of about 100 kilohertz measured on the RF spectrometer. And as you get closer, the load Q will decrease the, um, compared to the uh, undercouple Q. And then the, uh, the frequency bandwidth goes up to 3 megahertz. So you can actually see that um, coupling is happening very well. But as you go from 100 kilohertz to 3 megahertz, you actually see very little amount of power uh, loss. What that means is that we're actually having very good um, uh, low loss coupling. But uh, for generating an octave or close to an octave um, comb, there's a challenge. The efficiency goes down like one over n. And then spectral efficiency, the FSR, as pointed out before, uh, the number of comb lines is dependent on one over FSR. And then the total uh, power per line is on the other 40 nanowatt when we try to do this on a 10 gigahertz resonator. So what we decided to do was um, similar to what Sanababa mentioned as a dispersive comb, but looking at this as a chi-free OPO. And instead of pumping a degenerate scheme and uh, pump that non-degenerate uh, wavelength, so you can basically generate a comb of signal and idler at those wavelengths. And uh, instead of trying to do this at one octave, we're going to do this at the 2F, 3F, which is then this will be 12, uh, 92 nanometer, this will be 1937 nanometer. 1937 nanometer frequency will be tripled. Uh, 1273 nanometer frequency will be uh, doubled. And this is the experimental result. Uh, we have pump wave and a group of combs at uh, 1292 and group of comb at 1937 nanometer. And they will go through uh, pipeline devices to achieve 2F, 3F uh, stabilization. In terms of the chips, uh, we're going to have 104 gigahertz resonator and uh, 26 gigahertz resonator uh, from a single laser and they'll be coupled and then resonate will be generating a, um, uh, 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 we actually have to put the pipeline device here and then do the uh, detector and locking and so on. But that's basically the kind of picture of the device that we're currently fabricating. Um, another thing that's very different from most of the other groups that are working on DODOS program is that uh, OEWEB has decades of experience in having stabilized uh, locking devices. And um, instead of having an optical isolator and so on, here are the um, small amount of um, uh, scattered uh, reflection resonant to the uh, high Q resonator comb uh, uh, resonance will actually lock the laser itself. So this whole thing will lo work like a long cavity on a cavity laser, except that the device will be very, very compact. And by doing so, you can actually go down to like a shallow time line width of like the, some hertz, like a few hertz, or down to a sub hertz. And, um, and as you operate these things in the proper scheme, you can actually uh, self-start the soliton without doing any uh, thermal locking and so on. In fact, they've been doing this for their commercial products. And uh, thermally locked uh, commonless oscillator versus the, the scheme that OE wave is using, there's about 60 dB um, uh, advantage or 60 dB lower um, RF loss at the end of phase noise at about the kilohertz uh, frequency. So then uh, the front end detail consists of the fact that we have single pump, and we're going to pump at about 150 milliwatt power, and we're going to divide that into two. One will be going to 104 gigahertz resonator. Another 26 gigahertz resonator, and then the um, 104 gigahertz resonator will generate uh, two thirds of an octave, and then we're going to lock with uh, two different uh, uh, separate lasers: DF laser 1937, 1292, 
and then goes to second harmonic and stippling, and then we will generate 645 nanometer, and that will allow us to uh, feedback control and lock. And then the 26 gigahertz resonator and uh, 104 gigahertz resonator will um, keep and lock and uh, lock the two resonators. And then the generated 104 giga, um, 1550 nanometer wave will go to the um, uh, uh, those back end. So that uh, the trip that we are fabricating right now, um, we actually completed recently, is consisting of the SHG plus thermal frequency generation to achieve crippling, and then SHG to generate the second harmonic, and the frequency output, the wavelength output would be 645 nanometer. Um, <coughs> for the um, crippling, we are also doing uh, thin film is now based, but for now, for the test bed, we're generating the uh, with, uh, reverse photon exchange sibling, and we're using non-critical phase matching condition in such a way that any tolerance in the uh, waveguide will be kind of cancelled out so that it will be um, narrow bandwidth application as well. This is the uh, device fabricated on XCAT max oxide that is now and we're using T polarization as mentioned earlier, and uh, we have achieved the uh, purity polling on the XCAT waveguide, and we're in the process of bonding that on uh, silicon dioxide and silicon waveguide for uh, tight confinement and so on. Another component that's important is to have chip scale uh, DMOX. We're separating 1550, 1291, 1937 nanometers, and these two will go to 2F, 3F chip, and then 1550 will go to the uh, back end device. And the device has been fabricated. We're going to do testing at this point. Um, there are a number of different detectors. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, 1292 detectors for locking 1292 lasers to the uh, broad comb, and then 1937 detector for locking to the uh, uh, 3F part of the detector. And then the, those lasers will go through tripling and doubling to generate 645 nanometer. And those detectors uh, uh, have been developed by uh, University of Virginia. And again, the rest of it goes through, and we'll have extra detectors to generate 26 gigahertz comb. And uh, one of the advantages of going with 2F, 3F, in fact, Stanford has gone, looked into the advantage of Stanford. There is actually a slight advantage of going with 2F, 3F. Um, if you look, include the uh, consideration of dark current and so on, the 645 nanometer detector has orders of magnitude lower dark current than uh, longer wavelength detectors because the band gap, the dark current goes like E to the minus E band gap divided by KT, and you have orders of magnitude improvement. Of course, you have to work harder to generate enough um, to have three of uh, heating signals. The detector will be mounted vertically on top of the silicon nitro waveguide. We have a deflector etched by focus and the matching, and the align mark, mark and the uh, electrodes will be lined up so that they will have uh, basically passive alignment to achieve high coupling. So that was the uh, front end. Now, quickly go to back end discussion. Assuming that we have very good stable frequency combs, the rest is to uh, use optical hybrid to act against the uh, tunable laser, and then you can achieve the tunable output as uh, specified against the uh, reference of 10 megahertz. So, um, once again, you start from the self reference comb, and then you have pick out one of the comb lines, and then have a uh, slave laser to um, tune across and then generate a beat comb. And uh, we are doing this uh, one gigahertz loop bandwidth based, um, uh, what we call optical phase frequency lock loop. And to achieve this, you really have to go to uh, integrated chip. So the bulk devices tend to be fairly large. You cannot achieve one gigahertz bandwidth and so on. And then you lock them and then you do uh, uh, zero, 90 degrees. We have full uh, optical hybrid detection so that you can achieve the um, uh, full field information, including uh, the phase and amplitude. So the, uh, the previously demonstrated uh, OPFLL was based on uh, sample grade in DDR laser, and there they were able to generate the 1.1 gigahertz closed loop bandwidth with the uh, integrated chip. And they were able to pretty much duplicate the line width of whatever reference coming in. If the reference has, say, 10 hertz line width, they can actually generate the laser output lock to that channel hole, so the line width was really determined by the reference rather than the natural line width of the tunable laser itself. Um, demonstration of that uh, one gigahertz loop bandwidth uh, was shown here. They were able to show that 
you can turn off and on the reference laser and achieve uh, phase locking, uh, frequency locking, and phase locking within about 600 uh, nanoseconds. Really fast uh, 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 locking uh, method. And uh, in OPFL components, they have this, again, uh, integrated uh, electrical IC with a hybrid uh, uh, loop filter. And then the PIC. PIC basically, super integrated circuit basically integrates the tunable laser with the uh, optical hybrid and uh, four detectors uh, that work like two balance detectors all in chip. And by having this very compact integration, they can achieve 1.1 gigahertz uh, loop bandwidth. And once again, the um, frequency locking, where the importance of this uh, four phase detection is that we can actually detect the, the red side or blue side of frequency offset without any ambiguity. So then uh, you can actually see that uh, your reference laser is on the blue side or red side, and then you can achieve the tuning to the red or blue as desired. The integration scheme of indium phosphide here is based on monolithic indium phosphide to be integrated on silicon later on by hydrogen filtration. Fabrication process includes active passive integration with uh, uh, regrowth and deep patching and so on. Uh, if fabrication step completes, the passive waveguide, laser gain region, uh, amplifier, and the detectors all do this uh, monolithic integration process. And then this chip will be integrated on our silicon nitride, silicon dioxide platform. And here, this is just kind of intermediate step where we are demonstrating thick with the uh, cost, the commercial off the shelf um, uh, 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 the, uh, the chips. And we're able to uh, do some uh, tuning and demonstration of the CW OPLL, up the phase loop. And we can actually generate the frequency comb of uh, optical output at the various uh, frequencies. The conceptual diagram, the conceptual fabrication of this uh, heterogeneous integration step includes multiple of those chips, indium phosphide chips, resonators, and uh, silicon microwave guys, lithium alveate, and so on. And in principle, we can complete this in a um, wafer scale. We typically do this on a 16 silicon uh, wafer scale. And uh, there are multiple different kinds of uh, material platforms, indium phosphide. We'll have antimonide, which has galmasonite, we have zeppelin. And they'll be all integrated on a silicon uh, nitro with a platform with uh, um, alignment. And eventually, this will be integrated on a, in a module. And currently, we're doing heterogeneous integration, which means that uh, instead of worrying about monolithic compatibility with everything, even though in the phosphate devices, monolithic are integrated, the rest of the devices, silicon dioxide, silicon nitride, or lithium nitride, would be integrated based on um, off angle. At this integration with the mode matching at about 5.3 micron mode beam profile. For phase one, currently we're doing chip to chip by having bulk um, uh, lens or having lens to fiber type of integration. We expect to have about uh, 1 dB or less uh, loss in this type of uh, integration. So eventually, uh, by the time we go to phase two and phase three, we will integrate those things on a, a compact module. And as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to do this on a one cubic centimeter. And um, OE Wave has um, a proven record of generating this type of nice package uh, with uh, thermal engineering and you know, temperature control, everything, all that's included in the thermal budget of one watt. So, to summarize, uh, we're working on the uh, heterogeneous integrated micro optical synthesizer for Dodos. We have front end and back end. Front end consists of Two high Q resonators for low noise, low power, broadband uh, operation. Self reference, uh, 2 f 3 f stabilization, active scale. Self injection locking for simple and stable narrow line width operation. And the back end will have optical phase frequency loop, uh, uh, loop lock, uh, photonic circuit, together with the electric ICs, with cost of loop for unambiguous and accurate optical frequency synthesis. And heterogeneous integration on silicon will have macroride uh, resonators with a very uh, low loss uh, on subcapillar with a Q of like 40, deep, 40 uh, billion. And low loss silicon nitride, silicon, dio uh, silicon dioxide couplers and multiplexers, imiphosphide uh, devices, plus galimantonide and the RGF detectors, and triplins, and that will be a uh, film with Navit. And uh, as the total score is, uh, we're aiming at 
below 1 watt power consumption, below 10 to minus 13 over tau uh, stability, below 1 hertz um, uh, uh, accuracy or resolution, and below 1 cubic centimeter um, uh, size and weight in terms of uh, volume. So that concludes my talk. Thank you.